Welcome back, ladies and gents, to another edition of Smash Speculation. And this week is where I go back on my word from about a month ago. Originally, I said I would not be doing a top five for a company that featured a third-party character in the first Fighter's Pass, which included Atlas, Square Enix, Microsoft, and SNK. But since I was really stuck to fill a spot for this week and asked you guys for a potential third-party company... The best request happened to be Square Enix, and anytime I've done videos relating to characters from this company, they tend to be a hit. So me and my collaborators on my Discord server thought this was the best case company for this week's video. And as you might have remembered in a video of mine from last month, I pitted Gino and Sora against each other in a battle of my most wanted characters. So they are once again going to be talked about in this here video, because you can't do a top 5 potential Square Enix characters video without mentioning perhaps the two most vocally requested characters from the Square Enix catalog. So first we're going to start off with Sora, who's in this video via a honorable mention. What? How can this be? How can I, Braster? put Sora, a most wanted of myself and many others, outside the actual top five itself? Well, again, it's due to simple ownership. Sora is not fully owned by Square Enix. That's the tricky thing with him. Disney, at the least, has co-ownership of the Sora character and the rest of the Kingdom Hearts IP. So even though he is Square created and owned partially by them, Disney still has a say and guaranteed if Sora were by some miracle to get included into Smash Brothers, Disney's name would be included in the character credits for the game. And due to this multiple ownership, it would not really be a pure Square Enix deal. So, I'm exempting him from this week's top 5. If you haven't seen my video on Gino vs. Sora to get an idea of how I think he would fight and all that mumbo jumbo and you want to hear about it, go check that video out on my channel. Scroll through my uploads, you'll find it. So let's jump right into this week's list, shall we? Starting off with who came in. At number 5 for our potential next Square DLC character is... Neku from The World Ends With You. I really struggled on who to use when it came to filling this spot because I really couldn't use it for Sora due to his ties to Disney. And I didn't want to include another character from Final Fantasy or the Dragon Quest series because they have roster slots that represent their series well enough and most likely neither one of them are going to get another rep at all. Let's be real here. So I had to dig and find a character that I thought was decent enough, and even then he's clearly a filler character on this list. Then right before the writing of this video occurred, there was an interesting bit of speculation regarding Neku that existed and then was quickly snuffed out. So a prominent Square leaker who uses the screen name of Tensit said to prepare for something big regarding the future for the world ends with you. So most, of course, read between the lines and thought that this meant an inclusion in Fighters Pass Volume 2 for the protagonist. But some time has passed since then, and Tencent has practically confirmed that his teasing for The World Ends With You does not have anything to do with Smash Brothers. But since he had leaked information about Hero and Cloud coming to Smash previously on his leak record, many thought he was leaking his third Square character for Smash. That, of course, being Neku from The World Ends With You, but it was really just a bunch of people frantically jumping to that conclusion. I assume it's because of how dead and dry the Smash speculation sphere has been since March, so many people are just starved for any kind of credible and new information. But hold on, folks. We just have to wait a little bit while longer before we get that ARMS character. But when it comes to special move potential, how does Neku fare? Well... He has a few solid moves that could be worked with, starting off with neutral special, Pyrokinesis. Neku would hover slightly off the ground, clutch his headphones, and close his eyes while a burst of fire forms in front of him. If you continue to hold down the B button, he will it'll keep the flames surrounding Neku, and if you continue to hold down B while moving the control stick, the flames will surround Neku as he walks toward an opponent and stun them with its hurt box. So think of how Banjo walks around with Kazooie as an egg bazooka for like a visual representation of how that would work. Neku's side special would be Force Rounds. Neku would fire balls of energy at his opponents. It can be tapped repeatedly like Fox's blaster, but much like Fox's projectiles, it won't do much damage. 
There's also a cooldown in how much you can fire to make it a little different. It's a resource you have to work around when you do end up actually running out. Now we move on to his final special move, starting with up special, which would be Vulcan Uppercut. Neku would spring upward, performing an uppercut in said motion. And if an opponent is caught in its trajectory, this will deal heavy vertical knockback to them. And this move would obviously take a lot out of Neku, and as a result, he'd enter into a free fall after performing it. Whether you catch an opponent in it or not, regardless, he's going down. Then lastly, down special for Neku would be the Splish Splash Barrier. A stream of water and a blue ring will form around Neku, and he can heal himself when it's timed correctly. Sort of like Ness and Lucas's down special, but this one is going to be a little more committal. If you are caught within it multiple times in this very state then the Splish Splash Barrier will start to reduce until it's worn down to nothing. And much like with his side special, you will need to bide some time before this move fully reboots and you'll be able to use it again at full strength. When it comes to the old moveset potential, I'd say Neku has enough tools that would make him stand out. And let's not forget that The World Ends With You was a Nintendo DS exclusive for a long time. And only in recent years has it seen ports to devices such as mobile phones and the Nintendo Switch itself. So, it's a game that is a standalone Nintendo title at its core. And another fun fact about this game is that it was inspired by a previous Square title, Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories. And in fact, the cast of The World Ends With You were used in Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance. So in some weird way, this game is kind of connected to Kingdom Hearts. Without any of the Disney. Hell, even Neku himself kind of looks like Sora a bit. So even though his inclusion is the most unlikely on this list, Neku could potentially be our closest shot to having anything Kingdom Hearts-esque in Smash Brothers. Coming in at number 4 for our next potential Square Enix DLC character is... Tubi from Nier Automata, the protagonist for a good portion of the Nier game, but she isn't the protagonist the whole way through, but she's the character everybody remembers uh, the most. So over the last year or so, she's become quite a popular request when it comes to third-party inclusions. And an interesting thing is, she's created by the same company who created Bayonetta, that being Platinum Games. But the publishing rights are owned by Square Enix, so the deal would in fact be with Square themselves, which again... I'll mention is more than I can say for Sora. She has a very distinct look and a really cool design. Oh, and she wields a katana as well. So how would her moveset hold up? Well, let's take a look at her potential special moves. Starting with 2B's neutral special, which would be charge, as in ch a big charge shot from her katana. It'd be a charging strike that's very similar to what a bunch of other sorties already have in the game, but we could add a little spin animation to the katana when the move is executed at full strength. Side special would be the A160 Missile Pod Program. You ride along with this pod program and it'll thrust you forward and you collide into your opponents. The amount of distance you clear with this move will also dictate the amount of knockback and damage you do as well. Now we move on to our final two special moves, starting with up special, which would be her rising jump. 2B would lunge upward with her katana in spear position. Press B again while in the air to make the katana blade larger and slam it down on your opponents at a 45 degree angle. And lastly, our down special for 2B would be Evade slash Perfect Evade. It would function like a counter move, but when timed to perfection, multiple 2Bs would appear before you, and the real 2B herself would catch you in a flurry of strikes with her katana. So yeah, she has some usual swordy like tendencies, but there are some moves she can do that I listed that could make her stand out, and... In fact, there's, that's just the bare bones basics that they could do and take from the Automata. There are so many more moves in this game that would translate just absolutely perfectly to a Smash moveset. That and Nier Automata has developed quite a fan base in the three years since it released, including an ever-growing show of support from the Smash community, and it's got a ton of people who cosplay as, as Tubi. It's crazy. However, her game of origin has never had a Nintendo release, and I know that's not a strike that totally prevents a character from ever being included. Here's looking at you, Joker. But I feel if Square were to get that one last character, it needs to be either somebody super iconic, despite lack of Nintendo heritage, say like Cloud, in Cloud's case, or a Square Enix character that became absolutely adored by the Smash fan base due to their 
you know, game slash appearance on a Nintendo console in the first place, which there are a few of them that we'll get on to later on in this list. But if I had to be honest, the fact that Tubi herself is a Platinum Games created character, that might really help her chance for inclusion, given how Platinum and Nintendo have gotten in terms of relations and how close they are as of recent years. The Bayonetta and Wonderful 101 games being great examples of this. Uh, they were in, uh, A couple of them are Nintendo in exclusives, in fact. So Tubi might actually have an edge over other characters on this list, but it's still very much a matter of wait and see. Coming in at number three for our next potential DLC fighter from Square Enix is... Laura Croft from the Tomb Raider series. Without a doubt, the most recognizable face on this list. And honestly, I was going to give her the top spot of this list initially, but within the Smash community, there are two other characters I've seen requested far more over the years than her. But again, this doesn't take away from the fact that Laura herself is the most well-known female lead in all of video game history. Tomb Raider has been a staple of the action-adventure genre for well over two decades now, and it's been freshened up and changed with the times, which has kept the series fresh. And it's, it has a bunch of merchandise, it's had films based off of it in the past, and just so much more. Like other world-renowned series, there's a whole media brand built off of Tomb Raider, and for that alone, I think her inclusion would be one of those earth-shattering ones, in much the same vein as, say, Snake's or, or Cloud's inclusions to Smash were. Square Enix originally did not have ownership of this series in the beginning, uh, but they purchased Eidos back in 2009, and through that acquisition, they ended up becoming the owners of the Tomb Raider IP. So, a Laura inclusion in Smash, once again, would be a deal need to be made by the almighty Square. So, Laura is a huge name in gaming, but how would her special moves look when considering her as a future fighter? Well, honestly, there is a whole bunch that could be chosen from. But I'll do my personal best to keep it simple. Neutral special for Laura would be her trusty crossbow. It would cover similar space to Link's arrow, but you'll want to charge it so that its speed can increase. Also, if you hold down the B button, you can aim Laura's shot. But if you hold down that button for too long, Laura will misfire the arrow and you will not hit your target. Side special for Laura could be her torch. This could have two functions. First, just executing side B without holding it. Laura would strike forward with the torch for a clubbing blow of fire. You know, a, me a simple melee attack. But if you hold down B while doing this move, Laura would toss her torch upward and it would come crashing down and you can trap your opponents within it. Think of, say, the Belmont's Holy Water move that's already used in Ultimate. Now we move on to the final specials of Laura's theoretical kit, starting with Up Special, which could be the Rope Arrow. Execute Up B, and Laura will shoot a Rope Arrow, aka Tether Recovery, and climb to safety. Since the end of this Rope Arrow is sharp and quite deadly, it can also be used as an attack option. Also, when you get the Rope Arrow attached to your point of recovery, you will have to press B again, to zip up to safety. Now, we move on to her final special move, which could be her arrow change. This would be a resource mechanic where you choose which arrows to use for your neutral special. Choose between standard, fire, explosive, and penetrating arrows in your down special and use them up until you have to select a different arrow kind. There will be cooldowns to this mechanic, so you can't always just keep selecting the same arrow type over and over, like explosive ones, for example. You can't be doing that constantly. Instead, um, given your battle and what you're doing in it, you will have to choose another arrow type to use while the explosive kind recharges, or if you use up the special or you use the fire kind, you gotta wait for that to recharge, and so on and so forth. And once it's good to use again, you can use it again. So this would teach you to use all of your arrows effectively and use a good variety. So yeah, I think from a moveset potential, she has all the tools to stand out. She would be a standalone female character as well, which has been absent from the DLC we've been getting. Like, really, I, I don't count Byleth. The, the male skin's the default skin anyway. But most importantly of all, besides all that, she's a household name to many. And that includes non-gamers. But that's really only in the Western world. I don't think Tomb Raider is all that big in, say, Japan. And even though she is a Square Enix property of the modern day, the fact remains that Laura Croft is also a Western-created character, despite her Square ownership. 
and we know not many of them have gotten included in Smash over the years. Most of them just being recently in this Ultimate game. And I believe if Square were to get one more final character, it would be a character that they actually created of Japanese origin, and not just a property that they acquired from another Western company that they bought out. And for that reason alone, I could not place Lara Croft at number one, even though she has a ton of other merits that would have justified putting her in that spot. Coming in at number two for our next potential DLC fighter from Square Enix is... Chrono from Chrono Trigger. Perhaps the most desired JRPG character from Square's catalog to be included in Smash Bros. With his trademark red spiky hair, Chrono also uses a katana while knowing light magic abilities. This silent protagonist from the days of the Super Nintendo has always been longed for by the Smash fandom, as I mentioned just a little earlier. So, let's take a look at old Red's potential special moves, shall we? Well, we can start with neutral special for Chrono, which would be Cyclone. Spinning wildly like, say, Crash Bandicoot or Incineroar, but with a katana at hand. Chrono would spin and slash those who get in his way. This would be a multi-hit special. Next, we have Chrono's side special, which would be Wind Slash. Chrono would slash his katana at the ground, which would summon currents of wind that would glide forward. This move would do decent damage on impact and would also have the ability to trip up your opponents. Now let's end with his final two special moves, starting with up special, which would be lightning. This move will allow Chrono to float upwards for recovery, but it also has an option to help against ledge guarding. Hold down B to keep hovering until you make it back to stage. And once you do, release that B button and a bolt of lightning will strike down in front of Chrono, keeping foes away or stunning them in the process so that Chrono can get the advantage state. Then lastly, we have Chrono's down special, which would be cleave. Similarly to Yoshi's down special, Chrono would leap into the air, but upon doing so, he would vanish, leaving a shadow imprint behind in the air, and then suddenly come crashing back down with a katana strike onto his opponents below. Chrono Trigger stands as one of the most beloved JRPGs from the days of the Super Nintendo. As a result, Chrono, the protagonist, is loved by many. Most importantly, he's got a big, huge fandom in the Smash Brothers community, and... Uh, He's one of the Square characters that a lot of people would love to see get in. And that Nintendo history usually means something when it comes to a third-party guest inclusion. It's not always the end-all, be-all factor, but it's usually considered when it comes to these, you know, guest characters outside of Nintendo's own universes. It spawned a few other Chrono titles as the series went on a bit, but this is the one game that pretty much everybody remembers fondly and anybody, like, really enjoyed. You know, the rest of the series didn't really do as well as this one. So, this is the one that has the lasting legacy, which is good for Chrono's cause, because since he dies by the end of the game, this was his one and only playable appearance. So, he's only ever been in one game, but yet, he's still a popular request within the community. And, I think the most important thing of all is, despite all that, he is still the protagonist of the game. He is the main character of Chrono Trigger, which is more than I can say for our top seed, but my bias and generations of vocal fan support have helped me justify our number one spot for this list. Coming in at number one for our next potential Square Enix fighter is... Gino from Super Mario RPG. So yeah, if you've been following the channel for the last month or so, you know that Gino is pretty much the one long time lasting request I have left for Smash Brothers besides Sora. That means that most of the characters I've wanted to see get included have been, including Sonic, Mega Man, Ridley, Banjo, and Kazooie, you know. The exceptions, of course, being, still, to this day, Gino and Sora. But unlike Sora, who is partially, if not majority, owned by Disney, Gino is 100% a Square-owned property. And since he hasn't been used in ages, I imagine the price tag for him would be pennies on the dollar compared to the rest of the characters on this list. So he'd be an easy property to license due to the fact that he is 100% utterly irrelevant. He's also, on top of being completely irrelevant, when he was in a game, he was a side party character from Super Mario RPG, and obviously not at all the protagonist as that went to Mario himself. It was Mario's first RPG game after all. So what exactly does Gino have going for him? 
It may be a flimsy point, but it's his vocal and passionate fan base. Many of us on YouTube, a lot more of us on Smash Brothers related message boards, ever since the days leading into Brawl, we have hoped and speculated on Geno's arrival. Brawl came and went with no Geno. Smash 4 threw us a measly me costume. And now in Ultimate, Geno is one of the many collectible spirits. But the idea that potential spirit upgrades could happen for the second Fighter's Pass has us Geno supporters having hope once again. Because really, this second season is now or never. If this second pass comes and goes without Gino, I think it's safe to say he's been forever deemed too irrelevant to be featured as a fighter. Which I say is fair enough to admit his inclusion. But after the likes of Ridley, King K. Rool, Simon Belmont, and Banjo-Kazooie made it in, there's that one last fan request from the Brawl days to include. To make this game the one that made all the impossible characters come true and come to fruition. There will never, ever be an opportunity to do this again. As I said, it's very much now or never. I'll also completely repeat myself and say that every single special move that Geno does in Super Mario RPG, which includes Geno Beam, Geno Whirl, Geno Boost, and Geno Blast, would naturally fail every single one of his special move options if he were to be included in Smash Bros. Ultimate. If you want my more in-depth opinions and analysis on all those moves, you can go back and watch my Geno vs. Sora video from last month that I mentioned on earlier in this video. Search through my uploads, you're, you're bound to find it. So, yeah, my bias is kind of at play here. So, if you think Chrono or Laura Croft should have taken the Duke, call me out in the comments section. But as I said, I'm part of the Geno Collective that has sat through three generations of no Geno inclusion. And this is pretty much our last chance to think he could possibly be playable. And honestly, we're just all hoping for the best. Because deep down, I personally believe, if we're going to be honest here, that Square Enix already had a character in the first pass, as well as having one in the base game. So I don't expect them to get a second DLC character at all. Unless Sora makes it in. But again, I count him more of a Disney inclusion than a Square one. You know, that's just how it is. So since this video came out so late and not on the usual weekend release, within a few days I'm going to start putting together another video that I want to get out before the eventual reveal of the Arms Fighter. So this upcoming Monday I should have it good to go by. So you're going to get two top five videos in one week. The next video I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to rank the top five most likely Nintendo-owned first-party characters that could very well be making up the majority of this next Fighter's Pass. So keep an eye out for that video within the next four days or so. I, I owe it all to you for subscribing and for me just being late and, and not getting this done when I should have. So anyway, I will now throw the following questions to you guys. Did you agree with the Square Enix characters included in this list? If not, explain who I might have missed, how their chances rate, and last of all, do you agree with any of the top three in this video? Those being Gino, Chrono, and Laura Croft. I mean, any one of them could have been numbers 2, 3, and 1 in your opinion, right? So let me know all of your thoughts on this video in the comments below. Now we begin the cheapest of plugs. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time of the video again. As you can see by the lovely little graphic in front of you, there is a list of all of my social media and gaming presences. So please add and follow me on all those platforms to stay as up-to-date as you can with all of my content going forward. And for those of you who are new to the channel and enjoyed what you've seen and heard, click on that lovely little subscribe button. And thank you all so, so very much for watching.